to introduce Giovanni Ramos. Uh, he is coming uh, from us. He's not from very far from. Um, he's a, a at UCI as a yeah UC Chancellor's postdoc and Ford Foundation postdoc, uh, which are really impressive awards. Uh, he finished his PhD. Uh, at UCLA, and he studies um, mental health inequities and how they impact uh, racial and ethnic minoritized groups. And he will be talking about how digital uh, interventions can increase uh, access for those groups uh, to mental health. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Dr. Um I, I was joking that this morning my wife was saying like, why are you giving a talk in informatics? And uh, you're a psychologist, like, well, let's see how it goes. So today I wanna share some, some of the lessons that I learned by conducting the MINUS study. But before I even talk about the study itself, I just wanna share a little bit about myself, my background, because I really think that that informs some of the research questions and my approaches to get involved in the community. I was born and raised in Mexico. This is where this accent, this beautiful accent comes from. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm the first generation that was born in Mexico City. My, my folks are from the countryside and they only have a, a, a middle school education. Even though an early age, I didn't really think of much about it. That really shaped my experiences growing up. I often grew up in communities like the one depicted in this picture at the bottom in which sometimes we didn't have paved streets, not reliable running water, not a hospital in town. And after I graduated with a bachelor's degree in, clin in psychology, I was a clinician myself. Before I've been a researcher, I was a clinician. And I conducted clinical work with individuals with similar backgrounds to my own, because in Mexico, 50% of the population lives in poverty. So that was kind of my background and the communities that I started serving. And in 2013, I moved to Miami, Florida. Um, I have a really good story how I ended up in the States. Ask me over lunch or like over coffee, I'm happy to share. I'll spare you the details, but I will say that I moved as a monolingual Spanish speaker in 2013, meaning that I didn't know how to speak English and dealing with the immigration system, but also being a monolingual Spanish speaking really exposed me to some of the barriers that these individuals, uh, people from racial and ethnic minoritized individuals face to access basic services. Sometimes not being able to communicate with your provider, sometimes simply not having providers that speak your language so they can you cannot receive services. So I got involved with the vibrant Latino community in Miami and I started providing services there. And these two experiences growing up in Mexico and in Miami set like the foundation that I used to build my program of research at UCLA. So I moved to UCLA, which was so strange because it's next to Bel Air and Beverly Hills, a really wild place. But even in those places, if you know where to look at, there are pockets of poverty. And those were the communities that I was still serving while, while at UCLA. And, and drawing from my background, try to connect with them and providing services when often um, they are likely ignored by our system, by our mental health system. In an effort to continue my research and, and continue serving the communities that I'm really passionate about, I clinical psychology is a weird degree, so we completed a, a year of clinical internship, and I completed that in the Bronx, in the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, in the Montefiore Medical System, in which I provided services to, again, very marginalized individuals, most of them living in poverty. Sometimes it's like, hey, if I stop coming to therapists, it's, it's, don't take it personal. It's just that actually I'm not going to be able to make rent anymore. So I'm going to be living in a shelter. If the shelter is still close by, I'll come. If not, it was a pleasure meeting you. Those were the things that I was facing with providing services in, in the Bronx. And to me, that just highlighted the importance that it's not just about making the service more available. It's also thinking critically about the barriers that these individuals face when accessing set of services. To keep things interesting, I moved back to Southern California and I'm here now at the UCI in which I'm using all this personal experiences, all this knowledge um, to build a program in which I'm trying to address the inequities that we are finding now in digital space, how we can make these interventions more culturally appropriate, how we can make them actually reach the individuals that are less likely to seek services. So let's forget about me. Let's talk about the issue at hand. In the United States, racial and ethnic minoritized individuals present with at least similar, and in some cases, high, higher prevalence rates of mental health problems. 
However, they are less likely to seek services, even when they perceive that they have needs. They are less likely to access any type of mental health services, social work, psychiatry, psychology. And when they do so, it tends to be of lesser quality, fewer sessions, or even they don't receive evidence-based treatments. In other words, they don't receive interventions that, are, that have been shown to be effective. And when they receive services, they are also more likely to drop out of treatment um, compared to their white peers. Although there are numerous factors that are, contribute to this cycle of inequities, in my work, I have observed at least three things that are, I think, really crucial when trying to understand why these inequities co continue. One is a chronic exposure to stressors, such as discrimination, racism, a lack of cultural fit between the interventions that we provide to these families and the ones that are available and limited options just to access services in the first place. They tend to live in, in places where there are not providers of any type of mental health care. That's why in my work, I see digital interventions playing an important role in addressing these inequities, because if we are mindful about how we use these tools, we can provide culturally robust interventions that fit with the lives of these individuals, and we just make services more widely available. However, most of the research with these digital interventions has been conducted with middle to upper class white females, which are very different from some of the populations that I want to reach with these tools. Often it's not considered about whether these individuals have reliable access to the internet, what devices they have available to access the internet, and other competing demands that might interfere with their ability to engage in services. Also, there are issues of literacy. We can have an amazing program with a lot of text and maybe some of these individuals are not able to read or understand what they are reading. And sometimes they don't see their experiences and identities represented in the content of the, of the interventions that we are providing, which can be pretty alienating, just not thinking that actually um, this uh, resonates with them. However, more recently, people have been developing guidelines about how to improve the cultural fit of these evidence-based um, treatments now using digital tools. Uh, I will talk about those guidelines in a second, but my plan for today is to tell you about my experience conducting a self-guided app-based mindfulness meditation program for racial and ethnic minoritized individuals who experience significant levels of discrimination. I'll tell you what I found, why I thought that this was an important topic to explore, and some lessons that I hope that can help you if you're interested in engaging these populations in your work, and, and things tend to be mindful if we really want to address inequities in care and not just perpetuating the ones that we already see in face-to-face -face mental health uh, services. Um, just as a brief overview so we understand what we're talking about here, um, 60 to 70% of people of color report experience of discrimination every day. These instances of discrimination have been associated with poor mental health outcomes, such as stress, clinical depression, clinical anxiety, However, it's very unlikely that every single person who feels discriminated against is going to receive services, that they are going to be able to have access to a mental health provider. And even though there are strategies that they can use on their own, such as mindfulness meditation, so national surveys show that actually individuals with this background are less likely to access those services in the first place. That's why I think digital interventions can play a role in addressing this, uh, reducing that, street, that treatment gap by making the services more available. However, most of these interventions have been, have been designed with populations very different in mind. So sometimes the content is, is not necessarily appropriate. By the way, when I'm saying digital interventions, in this case, I was thinking about relying on the mighty smartphone because 85% of individuals from racial and ethnic minoritized backgrounds have one, and they tend to rely on these devices to access the internet. So we wouldn't be reinventing the wheel. We will be capitalizing upon devices that you already have. So the research question here was, is, is this approach even feasible? And okay, maybe feasible, but it's effective. Are we actually moving the needle with interventions like this in the community? Um, so in order to do this, I conducted a randomized control trial. Sorry about that, a randomized control trial. Uh, the power analysis, just to know that I have enough, um, my sample size allowed me to detect the, the effects that I had in mind, considering two groups, an intervention group, a control group, three repeated measures, baseline, mid-treatment, post-treatment, a correlation between 0.5, which is pretty conservative between the repeated measures 
and an effect size of 0 0.2, a very small effect size, which is consistent with what we normally find with these types of interventions. A sample size of 155 individuals gave me 95% uh, power to detect math, a group by time interaction. In other words, differences between the groups. Once I had an, in mind the sample size that I needed, this was my recruitment and eligibility. These individuals need to identify as individual of color. Um, they, importantly, this second point is the multicultural dimensional, multicultural discrimination module. That's my measure of discrimination. They needed to score in the 75 percentile of this measure. This measure was developed with an, a nation, um, national representative sample meaning that by the 75 percentile, we are talking about individuals who really experience significant instances in this discrimination, even a uh, level level country. Mm, the other things I don't think that are interesting, English speaking, because the app, unfortunately, was just available in, in English. Uh, remind me of that. I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about, mm -hmm. about that. Um, they didn't have to have a lot of practice with mindfulness meditation. Nowadays, a lot of people have some type of experience, but at least not having more than two hours before the um, before the, the the trial started, and just being willing to download the app. As you can see, we were able to reach 16, 1,600 individuals that were interested in participating in this trial. Almost a thousand completed the, the screening, and from those 4, 400, uh, 444 were eligible, and we started like enrolling them on a rolling basis until we reach our, our goal. Uh, we use block randomization and we either randomize it to the intervention group, I'll describe the intervention in a second, or a waitlist control group. I also have thoughts about why using a waitlist control group and some of the pros and cons about that. And uh, what you're looking at here is the flyer that we use for recruitment purposes. Um, I, I'll discuss later on some of the things that were successful in terms of recruitment, things that didn't go super well. Uh, please ask me about that. It was it was pretty interesting to see what actually resonates with these individuals and, and what doesn't. In terms of our measures, how we measure the constructs of interest, they are the most common measures of stress, anxiety, and depression used in psychology. They had amazing psychometric properties with our sample. But I think it's more interesting to talk about the feasibility outcomes and how we define them in this study. The optic, we were interested in knowing how many people were going to actually download the app. Like some, it's not uncommon that people participate in these trials, but they never download the app, so therefore they never receive the intervention. We were also interested in knowing the number of days that they used the app, the number of meditations completed, minutes meditating in total, and the dropout that we define as not completing the last assessment a month later. Data were collected via Poltrix. We sent them text messages with a link to Poltrix, and we did it at baseline, week zero, when they started the treatment. Mid treatment, which is two weeks later, and, and four weeks later at, at post treatment. So the intervention, the intervention was the commercially available app, Ten Percent Happier. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it. It has podcasts. It's kind of like um, a widely used available app. We selected this app because even though a lot of apps out in the market make claims about being effective to reducing mental health symptoms, often they don't have the components that we can consider them evidence-based. For example, uh, an app can make the claim that it's uh, gonna reduce stress or anxiety, but it doesn't have any component, any techniques that actually we know work to reduce anxiety. I, um, I personally reviewed the app and I was really impressed by the evidence base of this app. I really thought that you had a very good introductory course, meaning that even if you don't, you have any idea about mindfulness meditation, this app can teach you the basics. Think of mindfulness 101. It was really interesting. It was really important for me that that was the case because I didn't want to assume that people already knew how to meditate. Um, and also it just has good ratings. People like the app in, in, on the Apple marketplace and the Google marketplace. Uh, we asked them how to complete one meditation daily for four weeks, and we suggested these courses. This covers the 28 days that the, the program lasted. However, we also encourage them to think um, flexibly about this intervention. We, I often use the, the analogy of flossing. I don't know anyone who doesn't floss one day and say like, oh, I'm a terrible human being. I won't do it again. No, you just do it the next day. Well, think of mindfulness practice the same way. If you forget one day, just try the next day. Don't, don't worry too much about it. And also make it work with your schedule. Be flexible. You don't have to meditate at the same time every day. 
You can do it in the morning. You can do it in the middle of the day during lunch. Do it at night. When is the most effective time to meditate? Whenever you have the chance. Uh, and I want to actually highlight the fact that this app wasn't culturally adapted for racially and ethnically minoritized individuals. It was just commercially available, which you will say like, wait, 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 wait. We are talking about how to make these apps better for these populations, and now you use an app like this? Well, I think that many people who are interested in using digital interventions are not in the position to actually develop their own apps or culturally adapt the content. I think another strategy that has a lot of promise is to improve the fit, the cultural fit of these interventions by integrating human support. And that was the approach that we took here in the Mindfulness for Us study. We use an onboarding procedure. Before starting the, the trial, we can send all particip participants over the phone, meaning that normally in, in other in interventions, people look at the consent online, they say, I want to participate, and they never interact with anyone. They get the intervention, you're good to go. In this case, we had personal contact with them. We made sure that we answered all their questions just to make sure that they actually they wanted to participate in the program. We held them in downloading the app. If you will see the characteristics of the sample. It was pretty young and pretty tech savvy. And you will still be surprised about how many glitches, issues, difficulties people had downloading the app. I imagine we know that a lot of people just, they try to do something, but if there's the first barrier and they just like abort mission. So we, we address that by providing good support in downloading the app. We also teach them how to use the app, how to navigate the content. And importantly, we had an open discussion about the content of the meditation app. We said like, hey, you're participating in the Mindfulness for Us study. When we say us, we're talking about people of color, people with your background, but we are giving you an app that wasn't necessarily designed for people like you. And the person who's gonna be your teacher for most of, of the content is an individual who's, who's uh, identified as white. Do you have any reactions about this? How does this sit well with you? Some people were like, hey, I'm just really curious. I'll give it a try. Some people actually had like, hey, this feels misleading. Why are you saying doing, doing a program like this? And you are giving me an app that it wasn't designed for people like us. Regardless of the answer, it just gave an amazing opportunity to validate their experience and provide education about mindfulness principles, why regardless of your race or ethnicity, mindfulness can be effective for you. And uh, dispelling some myths about digital interventions as not being effective, for example. So it was always, regardless of how the participant reacted, it was always a nice opportunity to provide some psycho -ed around those topics. And the last thing that we did during this onboarding was just coping ahead with them. It's like, hey, you're going to be busy. Things are going to get in the way. How can we try to think of ways so you use the app more consistently? Uh, sometimes it was like thinking about like joining the meditation, integrating the meditation into their night routines or the, the early morning routines, things as simple as that. Um, it sounds like a lot, but actually the onboarding procedures lasted from 15 minutes. Some people who were really chatting had a lot of questions, 35 minutes. That was like uh, the longest that we, we spent with one participant. So I would like to think that they got a personal coach at the very beginning of the intervention, uh, answering all their questions. And we also use daily text messages, simple text messages just to keep them engaged with just reminders about their mindfulness practice and motivational and psychoeducational content. And you'll see how this onboarding procedure maps onto recent guidelines on how to improve the cultural fit of these interventions. Uh, I'll talk about that later in, in, in this presentation. So things a little bit less interesting, how just I analyze the data. We use a multi-level regression model in intention to treat analysis, meaning once randomized, always analyze, regardless of the level of engagement of the participant. So some of them may never open the app, but still we included the data. That gives us a better sense of whether this intervention is actually working. We use random intercepts and slope, allowing people to start at different places and their slope moving at different grades. Um, our regressive error structure just meaning that the evals were correlated with one another. Obviously, baseline is correlated with mid-treatment and mid-treatment with post-treatment. This type of specification accounts for that. And we added some covariates that we thought that were interesting. We calculate some effect sizes using pseudo R squares, which is a good metric for multi-level analysis. And we use the, what is called the minimum clinically important difference, because it's possible that you can find a statistically significant differences in other words, the groups look different, 
but actually are these reductions in symptoms clinically meaningful? So this, these are uh, metrics that have been developed in advance. There are a couple in the literature and we contrasted our reductions in this intervention versus this, just to get a better sense is, is they look different, but actually are making, is making this intervention a difference in their lives. And finally, we just conducted some descriptives to get a sense of how uh, people use the app during the 28 days that the program lasted. This was the final sample, 155 racially and ethnically minoritized individuals. As you can see, most of them in their late 20s with some variation, 82% female, which is not very surprising given what we have seen in, in previous trials. I have a lot of thoughts about that as well. Please ask me about it. And the distribution in terms of race and ethnicity, we had most of them self-identify as Latinx or Asian, Asian American or Pacific Islander. We were in less successful in, in um, reaching black and multiracial Native American individuals. And 15% of them reported not having enough money to cover their daily basic needs. Now, as you might remember, the only, in terms of symptoms, the only thing that we uh, included in, in our eligibility criteria was presenting with significant levels of discrimination. Now, look at the mental health needs of this population. 90% of them presented with a statistic, a clinically significant levels of stress. Almost 40% had like met criteria for a, at least one um, um, anxiety disorder and almost 36% met criteria for a major depressive disorder. So definitely when you experience discrimination, there are mental health needs in this population. In terms of the feasibility, is this something that actually is gonna work out in the wild? In terms of the uptake, 100% of participants downloaded the app, no surprisingly, we help them do so. But that's something that we'll discuss how it contrasts with previous literature. Uh, in terms of engagement, people use the app on average 17 days from a range from zero to 28, meaning some people never open the app, some people open it every day during the intervention. Um, they completed on average 23 meditations with a range from zero, again, some people never open the app and some people, um, completed 54 meditations during those 28 days. And in terms of the time meditated, almost four hours in terms of minutes, and someone almost meditated 11 hours during those um, 28 days. So there was some range in terms of how often they meditated. And I think in terms of the dropout, if you look at the whole trial, we lost less than 8% of individuals. However, I think it's better to look at the, at the dropout rate that we see in the intervention group. Since these are the people we are actually asking them to do things, they actually need to invest time. So we, we lost almost 14% of the intervention group in this trial. And we lost someone in the, in the control group in which we just asked them like, just chill, we'll give you the app in later. And even then we lost someone. In terms of effectiveness, is this thing working? Is effective to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression? Those are the outcomes that uh, I'm presenting today. We also look at other things such as mindfulness, trade, uh, self-compassion, rumination. Um, um, if you are interested about those variables, just ask me. But for any stress of time, I'm just gonna present this. Uh, we found differences even in the first two weeks between the two groups. And by the end of the four weeks, we also found differences. But I'm more interested again here in the, the final reduction. It was bigger than what normally is expected if you are achieving clinically meaningful differences in terms of stress. In other words, in four weeks, we were able to reduce their stress to a level that actually they felt differences in their lives. We found a very similar pattern with anxiety. However, here in terms of the reduction, there are some measures that we definitely um, exceeded but there's, there's at least one study that determines the MCID as a reduction of six points. We were far from that one. The most conservative we didn't achieve, we actually achieved most of them though. I think like at least I have seen three or four different MCIDs in the literature and we, we overpassed at least four of them, I'm sorry, three of them. And that was also the case with depression. Same pattern, as you can see, very consistent results, two weeks, four weeks reductions and for some of them, we were able to make like a clinically meaningful difference in their lives. So just some takeaways from this study. Um, the app uptake was outstanding. We actually were able to, um, to have all participants download the app, which is not the case 
this statistic that I'm reporting here is what like some meta analysis have found in, in digital interventions based uh, on apps. From eight to 60% of people never download the app. So they never received the, the intervention. We didn't have that issue in this trial. In terms of treatment engagement, it was consistent over four weeks. I didn't present this data just in the interest of time, but if we compare how they used the app in the first two weeks and in the last two weeks, it was pretty equivalent. There weren't significant differences, meaning that they use it consistently, which is not the case with most um, app-based interventions. Normally people use the app a couple of times, uh, the first week, and after that there's a steep decrease in use. We didn't find this in, in this trial. So something something is happening here. And in terms of the dropout rate, we still lost 14%, which take it for what it's worth, but in, in, other, in other trials, we see that one out of four or over half of the sample leave the trial prematurely. And that takes me to the last point. I believe that the engagement strategies that we use are moving the needle. Uh, something is happening. They seem to work. However, I want to be mindful that my study design doesn't allow me to make claims about the effectiveness of this uh, engagement strategies. I didn't randomize them. I didn't give them and let it stop and let it try again. So we pretty much throw everything at them and see, let's see if it's working. Seems to be the case, but I really think that in the future, researchers really need to start examining this. Is it the wording procedure? Is it the text messages? Um, it's coming to mind a recent article saying that some type of human interaction at the very beginning of the intervention seems to be more effective than every week. So we need to be more creative about our designs to, to really piece apart these effects in terms of engagement strategies. In terms of reduction of symptoms, it seems that this app-based mindfulness intervention works and we were able to achieve clinically meaningful reductions in just four weeks. That's good news. I think that there's like a market for something like this. And when I'm saying market, not necessarily in terms of monetary, but like a need that we can address with interventions like this. Um, in terms of cultural adaptations, as I mentioned, the content of the app itself wasn't culturally adapted. However, the onboarding procedure and the daily text messages might be able to address some of those uh, concerns about misfit between the culture of these individuals and, and, um, and the content of the app. I think that this is a promising approach. Again, I think very few people who are in the mental health field and in a position of developing their own apps when psychologists develop apps, uh, they suck. They tend to, they tend to, they don't have that background. And I think sometimes collaboration between departments of informatics and psychology can be really helpful. You always have people like Steven Schuller who may, who might be able to design something nice, but mostly I will say, I don't know. I don't know. And I think that this is something that is really dear to me, the idea of low intensity interventions what I call good enough interventions. I think in psychology, we're obsessed with giving people 12 sessions, once a week, 15 minutes each session of CBT, if you have depression. And we just know that that's not sustainable. Uh, I think low time commitment, flexible with uh, uh, interventions with no reading or writing has a lot of promise. I, I often use an analogy when I talk about like what I call good enough interventions in the field. I tell people, we know that we have gold and copper. We know that gold is a better conductor of electricity, right? Why don't we use copper, uh, gold for ports and, and cheap stuff like this? Why? Because it's not sustainable. We use copper because it's good enough. So why are we not thinking about um, mental health interventions as good enough? Why are we obsessed with gold when maybe we can make copper widely available and still move the needle for these families? And that ties to the last point that I am talking about today, about the rich, the rich potential of this intervention. We know that we will never have enough mental health providers to address the need of, of in, just in the United States or, or globally. And I think low intensity um, interventions can fill some of those gaps. We are gonna be able to especially reach individuals who live in, in, in settings where they have less access to mental health providers. And I think that's where I see the promise of digital interventions in reducing inequities in care for, for these individuals. Um, with that, I hope that I, if not convinced you, at least made you a little bit interested in thinking of digital interventions as a way to address mental health inequities. There's promise, but we need to think about these strategies carefully, critically, and, and 
and do better, to be completely honest. I, I really think that I we need to do better in the field. And related to doing better, I want to share with you some of the big lessons that I learned myself. Maybe for you, these are going to be like, duh. But I think it's still, like I, I, I found it really illuminating conducting a trial with these individuals in mind and using some of the few guidelines that there are out there in the in the literature about how to improve the the cultural fit of digital intervention the first paper i published this in 2019 pre-pandemic times about maybe some strategies that we can use to engage these individuals in in digital care and and very recently i think a week or two weeks ago this paper came out um with elizabeth Eustis and, and dr schuler included here that also talk about ways in which we can improve the cultural fit of uh, digital interventions. So I'm gonna map some of the lessons that I learned myself to these clinical guidelines, and um, I would love to hear your thoughts. The first lesson that I that I learned is clearly define the needs and potential effective interventions. I think in academia, sometimes we fuse ourselves with identities. I'm the machine learning guy. I'm the apps person. I, I use digital phenotyping. So we have a tool, we have a hammer, and we start looking for nails everywhere. But sometimes I think that we are forgetting that it would be better to understand the needs of the community first. And in, in the particular case of the mindfulness, uh, mindfulness for us study, this, the conceptualization began in 2020. I don't know if, I know everyone is trying to forget 2020, mm -hmm. but if you keep in mind what was going on then, we were in a lockdown, there were a lot of instances of police brutality. The political climate wasn't necessarily very welcoming for racial and ethnic minorities. And also the coronavirus was going on and there were a lot of like hate crimes against certain racial and ethnic groups. The need for a service like this was there. Um, and that's why it, I thought that that was the need. And I started like thinking, what would be an effective intervention for these individuals? And when I started thinking about something that could work for them, I find mindfulness meditation. But I thought critically about why I thought that mindfulness meditation was going to work. And this is the conceptual model in, in some of what we in psychology would call the mechanisms of change of this intervention. And pretty much what are the things that we are moving to lead to reductions of stress, anxiety, and depression. Uh, those were some of the outcomes that we look at. Again, I didn't have the time to share that with you. But again, so there was, I identify a need. I thought critically about the intervention that can map onto that need and, and develop the, the intervention. And this lesson maps nicely with the case conceptualization in digital mental health interventions. That's what I call in the paper in 2019. And Dr. Schuller and, and collaborators call it the why, the clinical aims of content and how behavior changes strategies. In other words, why, uh, what is the, the content and how it's gonna address this. The last thing that I wanna talk about the first lesson is we need to go out in the community and ask these communities, what do they need? What, what, what do you need? What are like the things that we can address? And we need to listen. We really need to listen and understand their needs instead of once again, go with our hammer and start like looking for nails in the community. And being open to listen when they say like, no, that doesn't resonate, that doesn't work. And maybe um, adjust our research agenda based on uh, the, the needs of the community. So I really encourage researchers to get out of the ivory tower and go out in the community, ask questions, listen, and identify those needs. The second lesson is choose your tech tools wisely. When I was developing the MINUS study, don't ask me how, but a research company hear about my project and they reach out to my mentor back then. And we had a meeting and they showed us this amazing virtual reality set to teach mindfulness. I left that meeting with two realizations. Number one, if I were to partner up with this company, I'm pretty sure that I could publish a nice paper because the thing was really impressive. It was pretty fancy. It was really cool. My second realization is that this thing was never gonna move the needle out in the community, at least in the communities that I wanted to reach. Because some of them, again, they just rely on their smartphones to access the internet. Maybe this company was gonna pay for these virtual reality sets, but after they were gone, what's next? I'm not saying that actually this is not an avenue that we should pursue. I think that we should think about different markets for different people, different needs, but at least for the communities that I wanted to reach, 
a virtual reality set that co uh, that costs a couple hundred bucks didn't make any sense. So, and this I discuss in what I call the determine whether technology is a feasible option in my own guidelines and in the guidelines developed by Dr. Schuler and collaborators, what and how elements and technical characteristics when the workflow. Again, that's why I rely on the mighty smartphone and SMS, text messages. That was as fancy as this intervention was. The third lesson is even if you build it, they might not come. I think we assume that if we have a nice intervention, people are gonna reach out, people are gonna use it. And it was really interesting to see that in the end, if you look at my sample, maybe I reach out 155 racially and ethnically minoritized individuals, but I still reach those that are highly educated and mostly middle class with, with good, good income. So if you ask me if I feel that I was successful in reaching some of those communities, maybe, big maybe, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. It was interesting that when, when I realized that actually my sample was just looking very affluent, I needed to reconceptualize my strategy to recruitment. I reached out to some community partners and community colleges in Imperial Valley, California, in a rural community when we have some partnerships and that allowed me to diversify my sample. But if not, I think once again, just assuming that because I created something for these individuals, they were gonna show up um, was inaccurate. So once again, don't assume that just because you build something for them, they will come. You need to go out in the community. Um, and by the way, like this flyer, I just remember something that was really interesting in my experience recruiting. I spent, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 hours play, uh, posting flyers out in communities with a big representation of racial and ethnic minoritized individuals. How many people do you think that I reach with my physical flyers? People who actually scan that QR code. Anyone wants to guess? For 155? Zero. Mm -hmm. Close? Mm -hmm. Five. Five individuals. And I, I invested 30 minutes and a lot of money printing this and color. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we need to be mindful about where these people, uh, where these people are actually, uh, what spaces they are occupying, and and how we can reach them. We need to be more intentional about that. Um, and again, this this is not included in the guidelines developed by Dr. Schuber. I think it, this principle is infused throughout the entire manuscript, for example. And the last lesson that I want to share with you is: don't assume, fill in the blank, and provide support. I think. This is probably my biggest feed, with, uh, my biggest beef with uh, digital interventions um, for mental health uh, camp. That we design these interventions, we don't help these communities to really engage with them, and then we throw our hands to the air and say, "But it doesn't work." You see, no one uses it. Yeah, because this wasn't designed for them. You are not understanding their needs. You are not understanding that they have many barriers that get in the way for them to engage in these interventions. I think uh, to be completely with you, sometimes I even think that it's unethical to run this, these trials when we don't provide support for them to engage. We are spending a lot of money, a lot of resources, and later we are surprised that we don't find any signal that this intervention is working. I think by not assuming that they know how to use their phones, by not assuming that they have reliable internet, by not assuming that they are gonna understand how the interventions work, we are better off. Designing for the most vulnerable in mind is very likely to help anyone else. And I wish I could claim uh, ownership of this amazing di diagram. That's the efficiency model of support uh, by Dr. Schuler. And I think that really captures my, my thinking about why we need to provide support. And that's what I call back in the day, assess comfort level with technology and consider cultural factors that might affect uh, the implementation of these interventions. But again, don't assume make sure that you provide at least the, the minimum support so they can engage. So later on, you can say like the app works or it doesn't. And with that, I just wanna share what's next in terms of this line of research for me. We expanded the minor study. We recruit 80, 80 more participants and what, in which what I call the digital treatment as usual. I gave them the app and I said, good luck, do your thing. What most people do, what I've been telling you the whole hour not to do, that's what I did. Use the app, do your own thing. We just ended that phase of the of, of the of the research, and I I just pull up this data today. Sixty one percent uptake, so forty percent never downloaded the app in the first place. In contrast, by the hundred percent in the original minus, 
and 80% dropout. So I lost 80% of, of my participants here. Not surprisingly, I, I just assume I give them the app, you do you. Um, I'm really interested in using human-centered design strategies to better understand issues with mindfulness apps. I think mindfulness apps are an amazing intervention because they don't rely on any writing, reading. You can use them at any time. The time commitment is 10 minutes a day. I see a lot of promise in these interventions, but a lot of people, um, at least in the literature, there's a lot of concerns about this not resonating with the background of these individuals. So I want to actually use a data-driven approach, use human-centered design and gather information. Is this really true? Is this ugly? What about this app is turning you off? And I want to develop a coaching program. Again, I'm, I'm big on human support, a coaching program that addresses those issues. Um, I also want to think of it as an iteration. Normally people, I think researchers take the information from the community and they never come back and they assume that they address the issues that they found in their data. I want to go back to the same people. Hey, is this matching with what you're saying? Is this resonating with you? And later I want to train those people to be coaches for the program. That's, that's the idea. If you, that's your area of expertise, if you are into human-centered design, you want to reach this community, hit me up. We should work together. And finally, I want to compare those, the minus, what I presented today, with the digital treatment as usual, that sucks, and this new version with some coaching to see if we are actually able to improve human engagement more. Maybe the effect sizes of my interventions are bigger. Uh, if I also conduct a cost-effective analysis, how much we, are we spending on training these coaches? Is it worth our investment? That's what I see my research coming forward. Again, I love collaborating. If you're around and this sounds interesting to you, please reach out. I would love that. And with that, I just want to thank you. This was a long conversation. I hope that it wasn't super boring. It's embarrassing, but I'm really active on social media. If you scan any of those, you'll find me. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch. If you're old school, send me an email. I may or may not reply. Thank you. <laughs>
Good enough. So a lot of thoughts about that. I even think that in terms of perception, sometimes how you give, if you can give them the app for free, that's an incentive enough for a lot of people to use it. So I think we need to be creative about that. And again, the big takeaway for me at least, I don't think paying people is necessarily bad. Yeah, uh, I'm braving them. <laughs> one, one last comment. No, no I, please. I, I give the opportunity to others is that uh, I think uh, in terms of teasing apart the effects of money versus the effect of your treatment, um, you know, if you, if someone is if the researcher is paying the participants to adhere to the intervention, then of course money play, plays an important role in the effect. Mm -hmm. But if the money is merely to collect data for the response. Ah, I see. If you fill the question there so that I can get the response outcome, then I'm paying you money. In that case, the money has less to do with whether the treatment is working. Mm, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. My yes. thoughts will be that it will be difficult to tease apart yeah, that because is. once you have a little bit more cash in, in, in the pocket and you don't have to worry about things, especially when, when you don't come, come from a lot of money, it just frees a lot of bandwidth in your life to do things. So I think it, it would be, I'm, I'm, I'm even wondering if actually we can design something more clever and then really tease apart all the, that effect. But I really think that uh, this is reminding me, this conversation about just these programs in which we give them universal income and people just have amazing outcomes overall because just having a little extra change when you don't have much makes a difference in your life. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Hi, um, <clears throat> thanks so much for the talk. This was a lovely, very sensitive talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question about apps, and then I also have a question about um, universal, or, uh, universal basic income. Uh, do you have a preference for which one? <laughs> Let's do app because I don't know anything about yeah, universal like, basic income. <laughs> so, um, so I guess the question I have is like, you said, oh, this app is great. It doesn't require you to talk. But then I was looking at the kind of like onboarding page the onboarding screen, and it already started giving me anxiety. So it's just like, my refrigerator was turning up that dress, like, um, and then the other thing is like, all apps, you said mental health apps are shitty, but I don't think it's mental mm. health apps in particular. I think all apps are shitty. <laughs> they're getting shittier, right? They're like starting to look the same. They're starting to ask you the same questions. They're starting to like have the same color schemes. I can't really tell the difference between the app I use for my kid's daycare center from the app I'm supposed to use for the washing machine. I love what you're so saying. I guess what I'm saying is, like, <laughs> is there something distinctive about the design needs in this space that Ooh. would make the app more interesting and more mm. useful mm -hmm. rather than just being yet another cognitive drain on people who are already cognitive? Oh, I love what you're saying. There are so many things. Let's, uh, I'll take a stab at it. So the first thing that comes to mind when I said that, like, I don't remember saying shitty, but I like that term. So yeah, <laughs> mental health apps. It's a technical term now. There's <laughs> <laughs> like a whole thing about like- Oh, really? I shit the patient of apps. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting me patches to use the word shitty, right? Yeah, yeah I, I love it. it. I love it. Okay, so I think that I, I said shitty for apps. I didn't, but like, I love it. Um, in the In the sense that when we look at the content for most of the, what is commercially available out there, you look at the content, there are not a lot of evidence-based components. And as a psychologist, remember, that's my background, as a psychologist, that's something that is really worrisome. I don't think that, like, I'm, when, I, when I have issues with these apps, the part that I find the most concerning is making claims that this is going to help you when you are depressed. And there's nothing within the content of that app that makes me think that it's going to move that needle. That's what is a big, a big concern of mine. And I think that the literature is pretty consistent when, when it comes to that, when they have coded the content of apps, especially the most widely used, very limited content, whether we can consider evidence-based. Just to give you an example, a lot of apps for anxiety, the most common mental health disorder, just by, by average, someone here has a, um, an anxiety disorder right now. They download an app for anxiety. It's very unlikely that that app is going to contain exposure exercises. The gold standard treatment for anxiety. If you were to see me clinically in uh, as your therapist, I'm going to expose you to whatever is making you be afraid of. That's the gold standard. Those apps don't have that. So that's why I, I say that it's it's worrisome that piece. Now, in terms of the design, ah, it's tricky because again, I, I'm I'm coming from an angle of a psychologist, right? So I'm not great at designing things. I don't think that that's my area of expertise. And that's when I love conversations with other departments like informatics here, in which how can we make these apps less taxing 
So they resonate for these individuals, especially given like the populations that I work with, that they already maxed out with things. When, when we're talking about just going to your point about universal income and just having money, I think that people who live in poverty, like they are more cognitively taxed. It's like if they have to memorize, a, I think the research says like a five digit number and just remember it every, what you're doing in your life, living your life, try to remember that five digit number all the time. So I really think that we need to have more conversations on how to make, I agree with you, I agree with you. How can we make this apps less shitty? I agree with you. Do you want to talk about the second piece of your question? Um, no, I'll let someone else talk, maybe like in the best form of saying. I would love that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. Can we do one and two? Um, earlier you said you wanted to talk about the disproportionate uh, figure of 80, I think 88% uh, female for your, uh, your group. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for the reminder. I didn't do much better than most digital mental health interventions. Females, even in face-to-face -face interventions, females are the ones who are more likely to access mental health services. The same inequity now we are like transporting into the digital space. That doesn't sit well with me. I think we need to be more intentional about trying to recruit males. Um, maybe there's something to be said about mindfulness. A lot of people get turned off, like, oh, that feels like too mushy and weird. I, but, but it even happened with CBT. Uh, a good colleague of mine designed um, web-based intervention for college students, and she developed two different flyers for recruitment. One was called the Happiness Challenge. One was the Reboot Camp with like images about like working out and things like that. Which one do you think that males were more likely to, to access? Yes, yeah, I, I love how you were flexing your muscles. Yeah, that was even simple things like that about how we design our recruitment materials can make a difference. And I wish I had been more intentional in, in my research about that. 80%, I think like looks exactly what everyone else is getting in the research. And we need to do better when it comes to that and really understand. That's why I think human-centered design holds a lot of promise for me. I really want to understand why males are not getting interested or like why I'm not reaching you, why I'm not like getting you interested enough that you participate in these studies. Thank you for the question. Uh, so you mentioned human-centered design, and I think uh, although you didn't touch the app, the onboarding experience had some of that flavor of being designed for your users to address specific concerns and needs they have. So I do think that you probably, you kind of use human centered design there. Yes. Um, but I was wondering um, if you think that human presence for onboarding is a potentially community kind of based presence, mm -hmm. like is um, necessary, or you think that can maybe be transformed to be part of the digital experience? Mm -hmm. yeah, I Oh, wow, that's that's a great question. So the first piece is, it's interesting that you mentioned that because my lunch, before giving this talk, I was having lunch with the students in, in this amazing department. And we were saying that sometimes we use different terms, but we are getting at very similar things. And in this case, I will think, again, coming from a background as a clinical psychologist, I will say I'm using good clinical practices to improve engagement with any intervention. That's how I will approach it. If you think about it, like someone said, like that sounds like personalization. It's like, what's that? But maybe that's what it is. So maybe we are using different terms, but we are getting at, at different things. I I really think that like um, the onboarding made a difference in terms of like the content for these individuals. It was interesting just to see how turned off some individuals were by the fact that the app wasn't developed for them. And we were at least able to get a little bit of initial buy-in by that. And whether I think if that's necessary, I think right now, just based on my understanding of the literature, at the very beginning seems to be especially effective. Now, do I think that we can replace that in the future, maybe with a bot or something like that? I think that's an empirical question in and of itself. And I'm all about just determining what is like the cheapest way to do things. Um, if that were possible, I, I wouldn't have an issue with that. But honestly, again, in this case, I was doing the onboarding procedure, but let's think about people that are like what we call community health workers. Maybe 35 minutes of, of their time and having these effects is still a good investment of time. 
So it would be nice just to do a financial analysis of that piece versus like completely automating that. Those are my thoughts about that. So we are at time um, and we have a reception outside. We can spend time mingling and discussing more. So I invite you to come and have more conversation with you after this. Thank you. Thank you so much. How could I do with the uh, Zoom? Yeah, oh yeah.